I've been playing CDH for about two years now, and I just went to my first tournament this past weekend. And I waited so long because, one, I needed an event that was in my backyard and proxy friendly, because you boys' duels are fake. Now that I'm making content for the format, I feel a little more motivated to go and compete in these events, because I haven't played in a tournament in like five years, but that's a whole other story. And one of the things that really made me push it off for so long is between Twitter and things that I've heard from my friends, CEDH tournaments can sound like fucking nightmare fuel sometimes. Between king making, bad th plays, punting, uh, the bad politics, the poor threat assessment, that like, it, it all just sounded really bad to the point where my goal for this event was to just not have a miserable experience regardless of what my record was. And today I want to talk about some of the philosophical macro concepts that I took away from this event. I'm not really here to do a tournament report. I'm not super interested in telling you about the deck that I played or how my games went or anything like that. Partially because I went one in five. So anything that I say about my magic experience is going to inherently sound kind of whiny. This does also mean that for the sort of macro concepts, I was riding the loser's bracket, which is important to note about my experience because the further you get away from top 16 contention, sort of the more chill everybody is, the less everybody cares, you know, round five, round six, we're just kind of looking to play magic. We're all out of top cut contention, but I was checking in with my friends that were making top 16 up at the top tables, just sort of seeing what that environment was like. So the first thing, the, the main thing that I really wanted to find out going to a CEDH tournament is what is the average turn length of a CEDH game? Because in my personal testing pod, we've pretty much got it down to about turn three on average. We'll kill each other a lot on turn two, quite often on turn three, sometimes on turn four. We're rarely making it to turn five or anything past that. And I have been led to believe from my friends that go to tournaments that the average turn length of a tournament game is much longer. One of the problems that I've run into is when I listen to like content creators that do tournament reports, unless they died on a very early turn, like unless they got killed on turn two, they're not mentioning the actual turn count that the game ended on. They're not going, oh, and then on turn nine, we all died. And so couldn't really get data from that. And in my experience, that's about where my personal testing pod experience about lined up with what I got from the tournament. I died on turn four in round one. I died on turn two in round three. I died on turn three in round six. My games that went long definitely kind of felt like outliers. Uh, my round two, two of us sort of punted our mulligans and forgot to play the game. So it's naturally extended by the fact that it's effectively a two player game. Uh, round four, I two people decided to play table police for the entire game. And that, again, just drew things out really hard. And these don't feel like average games. I didn't see a lot of meta decks. And again, that's probably because I was writing the loser's bracket. And so it definitely feels weird to come up here and be like, yes, the things that aligned with what I'm already doing felt like the things that I should take into account. And the things that went against it definitely felt like outliers. But that sort of is what it is. And I'll continue to develop this as I go over uh, sort of more events and, and continue to broaden my horizons. But for now, yeah, it, it feels like I'm constantly dying like turn three, turn four, which is one of the big reasons that despite playing Dargo Thrasios, I didn't play Seedborn Muse. When you're constantly testing and dying on turn three, why are you playing Seedborn Muse? And so I'll continue to hate on Seedborn Muse, but that's a topic for another day. It does feel like the format is as fast as I was led to believe. And so that'll help me in my deck building process going forward. Uh, when I'm like mulliganing or just like thinking about a card and I'm like, okay, yeah, like I can't play this six drop. It's not coming down until turn four. Uh, it's just not really worth it. But again, I'll continue to evolve. And that's sort of a meta by meta thing. We're going to get a huge meta shakeup when Modern Horizons three drops. And from there I can reevaluate. But for now, it definitely feels like I cannot build my deck around going past turn four unless I'm playing multiple stacks pieces to extend that kind of game. Even the games where stacks pieces came out, we still died on turn four. It was just the person with the stacks pieces killing us. Another big thing that I was warned about was people playing too quickly in terms of like overriding triggers. Like you're gonna have to slow people down and remind them that you have a Ristic study that you have to draw for. I didn't really see anything like that, but I also didn't see anybody remembering their own Ristic study or Mystic Remora triggers. And I believe that the TO that I was playing under has this sort of blanket policy about being pretty lenient on taking back missed optional triggers. Uh, which, like, that, that's the policy that they want to go with. I'm going to play more of their events. That's a policy I'm going to have to accept. What didn't feel great is that a lot of my opponents were forgetting their own Ristic Study and Mystic Remora triggers. I was trying to throw out counter spells in response to those triggers, and in doing so, I felt like I was hampering myself instead of playing properly because I was reminding them of these triggers they would have forgotten otherwise. 
by responding to them. But you know, if I if I don't remind them of the triggers, if I just like throw out the counter spell and then you know two minutes later everybody remembers they had five Mystic or more draws, they're just gonna draw five cards. I'm like, okay, whatever. It made playing a little weird, but it's really not a huge thing. For the most part, everybody played uh, at a reasonable pace, remember their own triggers, didn't really run into any issues with that. I did see people at top tables running into issues with that. Like just so many people forgot so many triggers. I don't understand. And if you call your opponent on a missed trigger and you don't let them have it in like a normal competitive setting, that's not a dick move. It's not a dick move to make your opponent play by the rules of the game. If you forget an optional trigger, I don't care who was gonna win you the game, you forgot about it. Your point as a player is to remember your shit. That's probably a rant for another day. Uh, the final thing I wanna talk about is we did have something like, and not, not quite an incident, but it always feels like there's one big stink at every one of these events and we were not immune to that. Uh, at, in the final round, I'm watching one of my friends play for his win in and into top 16. At the table next to it is more players playing for a win in and into top 16. And essentially what happened at that table is player one is trying to win the game. Player four has a piece of interaction. I believe it was like an overloaded Cyclonic Rift. If they overload the Cyclonic Rift, player one will not win the game, but player two will almost definitely win the game on their turn. I couldn't tell if it was definite or almost definite or like a non-deterministic win, but essentially you run into this king-making scenario where whether player one wins or whether player two wins is solely in the hand of player four. Player four obviously doesn't really care which one of them wins because it's not going to be player four that is winning. And so these king-making scenarios do happen and they happen fairly often from my understanding. Um, not to everybody, but almost certainly at every event or close to it. And I've started to just think about it a little bit more. You know, what would I do in that scenario as player four? How do you politic that as player one and player two? It's a sort of one of the bigger nightmare points of the format. You don't really want to have to pre-philosophize how you would handle a king-making scenario, but it might be worth it for when you run into it in the future because there's a good chance that you or someone you know will. And uh, I'm kind of curious, not actually, if I'm gonna sit here and comment bait, I don't wanna know how you're gonna handle a king-making scenario. I do find that interesting, but I am more interested in finding out what your average length of, your average turn length of a CEDH game is because I'm trying to gather data on that so that I just have a better understanding of how fast or slow the format is because Turn three, turn four feels faster than I thought it would, but also that's what I've been testing with. That's what my tournament experience, or at least half of my tournament experience led me to believe. So it's like, that's what the data is saying. I'd like more data. Anyway, those are the big takeaways that I had is like, format's kind of fast. King making sucks, but it happens pretty often. Nobody remembers their triggers, but hey, what are you gonna do, I guess? Um, because the judge did let people roll back optional missed triggers. So it's like, okay, I, like I did what I could. The, the judge got involved. That's how it was ruled. Anyway, um, so yeah, I went one in five. My magic felt terrible, um, but you know, we'll just play blue farm next time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I did not have a miserable experience from a, a sort of external point, which is what I was worried about. So uh, my own personal like tournament experience, like play wise, definitely felt like if you go to turn like 10 tournaments and one of them is absolutely miserable and you're like, okay, that was an outlier. It feels like I just got that out of the way first. So. You know, we'll, we'll go to another one, see how it goes. Hopefully I can get one more in before MH3. Uh, but yeah, th thank you so much for watching.